Kel Seliger is an Amarillo Republican, uh, chairman of the Higher Education Committee. He's on education, he's on finance, like most senators, he's on a bunch of committees. He's been a member since 2004. He's a retired business owner, four-term mayor of Amarillo. He's married and has two kids. Kirk Watson is an Austin Democrat. He's the vice chair of nominations. He is also on finance, health and human services, higher education, et cetera, et cetera. Been a member since 2007. He's an attorney, and uh, like Seliger, he's part of the former mayor caucus. He's former mayor of Austin, and I met him when he was the chairman of the Texas Air Control Board yeah. back in the day. Married with two kids and one grandchild. That's right. In my last panel, every, all my grandchild counts were wrong. Uh, so this is a, a panel on the Senate <laughs> agenda, and I, let's just jump right into this. Um, you know, we have um, some new senators coming in. Um, we have, a, I guess, a one-seat party net change which um, makes the Senate math really interesting. How is it gonna be different over there? <laughs> Seniority. <laughs> Mayors can be ugly. Looks. <laughs> I'll even go with that. You know, the math, the math is what it is. It, its real importance may be the trend that it may, may show, and maybe, just maybe, there will be an added emphasis on bipartisanship and cooperation, realizing that we've got to get to, to, to May together with some real challenges that don't really look like Republican challenges or, or Democrat challenges when we talk about school finance and things like that. I agree, I agree with that. I, I think that there's a couple of ways to, to look at this. One is very specifically, and that's just the numbers of the Senate, and it does make a difference because, as we know, the rules... Uh, the rules take into account the numbers, and that makes a difference. Uh, particularly if if you have just name you know some form of bill or something, and we may not even know what it is that causes a, sen a, a a specific senator real heartburn in some way. One or two of them that you know set partisanship aside, it is something that's a problem for their district. It's a problem for them personally then those numbers become more important. The second part of that is, is what the senator just suggested, which is the election itself and the messages of the election itself and what that might mean, I think, also plays a difference. So uh, I, I, I'm pretty hopeful that what this, the, the change and the election itself, what it does is it puts us in a, a less partisan mood and a more of a problem-solving mood on the, the big issues we need to pay attention to between now and the end of the session. You know, there's a question there. I mean, there are a lot of people that are sort of, you know, what I call the barelys. They barely got back into office. Um, and unexpectedly, some of those are statewide officials. You know, uh, Dan Patrick only won with 5%, um, but he won. So I guess my question going into these, and I guess it's case by case, is going to be do they dig in and say we really need to double down because we almost lost at that time, or do they say I need to be a little bit more um, accepting of the other side? You know, what kind of a position does it put him in? The, 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 the question, you know, one of the things last session that was interesting was because the Republican majority was so strong and because voters had moved the sort of the Republican center to the right, there were more conservative Republicans than some of their predecessors, that um, Dan Patrick had the Senate that Bob Bullock always wanted. You know, he could kind of do what he wanted and kind of direct traffic in a way that um, diminished the power of senators. That looks like it's back up because of the numbers. It might be back up because of his re-election numbers. How do you read his position? Well, I'd say two things. Um, one is, and I would start with the senators themselves, and that is that if you look at the outcome of the election and not just, you know, you say senators and you hear that noise. It's, it's, they have their own yeah, trumpet yeah. section. Um, th we need that. Um, that's what we've been missing um, is a trumpet section. Um, the, the, so, so step back and look at, at, at multiple elections and not just one person's election. If you look at the senators' elections, and what that meant for those senators coming back and what it might mean in the next cycle and, and the cycle after that, I think it creates the, the real possibility, if not the probability, that people need to think about 
how do we make sure that senators can vote their districts, including districts that may be changing, and not requiring them to vote a, a certain way? allowing the, those elections to have meaning and consequences uh, for them and for future senators that are up just two years from now. The second part of that is, is I think that, that uh, folks are smart enough politically that they will look at what are some of the real messages of the election. And I think one of the big messages of the election was that people do want the legislature paying attention to I hate to say bread and butter issues, but bread and butter issues. Things like how do we really deal with property taxes in an honest and forthright way? How do we deal with public education in a way that is practical, pragmatic, and is going to achieve results? And not so much on issues that just get good headlines and, and, and divide us. You were smiling largely in the middle of that. <laughs> I was. I was. Senators can always vote their districts, uh -huh. but they can be cowed from it. And, and, and I'm hoping that's the message that this election brings. And, and as long as we're talking about the lieutenant governor, he does very, very sophisticated and, and frequent polling. I don't think there's much that, that get, gets past him, including the fact that look at, at the, all those Republicans, and they were mostly all Republicans who voted for Greg Abbott, and look how it fell off. And what we're having right now is we have Republicans, and this can be more true as we get away from straight ticket balloting, voters who are going to vote for some Republicans and not others. There's a message there. It's not lost on, on Senator Cruz, who I think does the same sophisticated polling, that no large city gave him more than 40%. But he dominated in rural Texas. Right. Now then, I don't think he's about to buy a house in Seminole, but there's... <laughs> There's a clear message there, and, and those folks get it. Yeah. Yeah. There was, a, I think it's 340, 350 voters, just mathematically, who voted for Beto O'Rourke and Greg Abbott. Is there a cautionary tale there? I mean, is there some kind of constituency emerging there, or are those Republicans who were leaving Republicans? What did, I mean, what does that tell us? Sure, the Republicans, the Republicans leaving re Republicans just as Democrats left Democrats in the late 80s and early 90s. Okay. It's, it's a simple schism, uh, and, and as a Republican, we have got to stop that. Right. We went from being dominant to simply a majority and we can compromise our own position there, and uh, we need to be very, very careful going forward, I think. Is that about how the Republicans in the legislature have been voting, or is that about how the Republicans <coughs> in the legislature have been choosing issues to vote on? Both. Okay. So do you think, you think this is going to be different in what way on the, on the floor? Is this going to be, I, I don't know if you're saying it's going to be a more moderate Senate, or if you're saying it's going to be open to some things it wasn't open to? or well, I, I'm not sure I would use... Everybody wants to put labels on different things, yeah. and, and I don't know what... I've gotten to where somebody will tell me that they're moderate, and then I, but I can't believe it. I mean, you know, somebody says they're right wing, left wing, whatever, progressive, whatever. So, so let's, let's stay away from that. I think you're already seeing some result um, of not just the election, but, but the campaign itself leading to an election. And as, as uh, Senator Seliger points out, there was some ability to predict some of what that election was going to look like, and it, and, and it built up to the election. And here's what I mean by there's some evidence of how people are going to react to it. What we have heard going so far going into this legislative session versus what we heard in terms of issues that we need to address that are going to be priority issues compared to what we've heard in the past already tells you that, that there's at least a sense we're going to address, again, more what I would consider to be the day-to-day -day issues of go government doing right by the people as opposed to divisive types of issues. I mean, we keep hearing uh, from those in control and to be in control that the number one priority is um, public education and how we deal with public education finance and the key part of that, of course, is property tax. Well, that's a lot different than what we were, in my, in my view, that's different than what we were hearing as we went into the last session. Now, whether that's more moderate, 
I think what it does is it creates a lot more opportunity if the leadership allows problem solving to occur and doesn't create divisions immediately that in some instances are false divisions, I think we can, we can, I think you will, it will allow for addressing issues that the public said in the last election they want us addressing. The, the question was, is the Senate going to be more moderate? Probably not. The doctrinaire uh, conservatives are going to be just as doctrinaire, right. as are the doctrinaire liberals. But the current climate is going to, to make us ask a question, is that sort of doctrinaire approach really representative of my district? And how is that going to look? And, and it's not by nature going to be more moderate, but is the gravity there going to be somewhat more toward moderation? And, uh, and that's, we'll see that fairly early on by the issues that come to the top. There are a lot of issues when we talk about public school finance. As Senator Watson pointed out, it goes right to property tax right. and, and the regulation of property tax and things like that. And, and we'll see fairly early on. And, and to follow up on the, 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 the moderation, is there, there are two factors there. One is that when the numbers, as you suggested in your first question, when those numbers change, it leads to more moderate thought because you need to build, you potentially need to build coalitions differently. The second thing I'd say about that is if you look at what happened in the last election, those districts didn't vote the way they may have been originally drawn, where you better be a far right Republican or the primary is all that will matter, or you better be a far left Democrat or the primary is all that matter because some of those districts that were red became purple. Um, and, and that also holds a message for the next cycle. But the third thing, I'll, I'll, I'll add a third thing. Issues like public school finance are, are complicated Gordian knots that you pull one thread of that, it has impact that you're not in, uh, anticipating in districts so that it requires at least a moderation in approach or you're just not going to get anything done. When you look at some of those big issues, let's talk about school finance, single largest part of our, our budget and things like that, and look at those issues, and that being equity and, and recapture and things like that. If we're going to have a real solution of setting go, instead of going forward into 2020 with the same system, we're going to have to work together because less and less are we going to see approaches that are patently Republican or Democrat. School finance is going to take a healthy dose of pragmatism, and pragmatism is neither liberal nor conservative. If you're uh, looking at property taxes, you're looking, you know, I mean, a bunch of po political issues blew up last session. At this time, two years ago, we all knew bathrooms was going to be a big bill. I'm not sure everybody knew that the House and Senate were going to come to blows about limits on local property taxes. There, there was plenty of fight in the, in the serious policy issues that they took on. Does that color the fight now or the debate now over school finance, property taxes? I am assuming another effort to limit local property tax increases by other governments. Um, isn't that the same fight? Or, you know, when you change the Senate a little bit, how do you change the outcomes of those issues? Well, it's by listening to the people in our districts. And it's interesting because the argument settles on property taxes, and it's easy for us to say, I'm going to take care of all your property tax problems. And you know why? Because the state gets no property tax. We could eliminate property tax. wouldn't hurt the state of Texas at all. It would obliterate school districts and local government and things like that. I was recently doing a town hall meeting, and a county commissioner was there. And I asked the lady there, I said, did you vote for this guy for re-election? And she said, yeah, I did. And I said, well, did he say he was going to reduce your property taxes by half, which he can do now almost today? And she said, well, no, he didn't. I said, well, why in the hell did you vote for him? Since property taxes are that important, a city council with two meetings, two public hearings, can reduce your property taxes to zero tomorrow, but you keep electing, we keep electing, the same people who didn't reduce taxes last time. Why is that? And, and it's, it's not necessarily a state solution. It's very much a local solution. Right, it's fire trucks. It's fire, yeah, it's fire trucks. It's fire it's, trucks. It's, 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 it's it is public road. schools. That's right. Right. It's public. And, and as I pointed out, our mayor in, in Amarillo, she can cut taxes. If somebody runs against her and says, I'm going to cut taxes in half, she's going to have a challenge. Can they cut taxes in half and add the 17 police officers? 
they're in the next budget? No. Here's the, here's the good news. That's their decision. And what has happened, go back to your question, in my view what happened was there were, we were not, be, some were not being candid with what the property tax problem was. And it was a classic political maneuver in my view of saying, of saying, I know where the, the property tax problem is. The property tax problem is, is that the state of Texas, the government of the state of Texas, has chosen to fund its public education system by utilizing local property taxes. People don't like that because they keep seeing their local property taxes going up, and the so-called truth in taxation bills, uh, I had one that would set, lay it all out, tell where... Tell where those property taxes are going, and it was a. It didn't pass, and it was a because I, I in, in part I think because they didn't want people to know exactly where the money was going to go. And then what they did is they set a fire over here, and said, "Oh, this is the cities and this is the counties." I think that's catching up. I think the public knows better, and I think it was part of what ha happened in this last election. So what my hope is is that we don't end up focusing on that aspect of it, and we end up focusing on what people are now saying they want to focus on, and that is school reform of our school systems and finance in a way that will, will provide property tax relief but not be doing damage uh, to cities and counties that have their own elected officials. You know what would provide almost instantaneous relief in that, context is from the state to go from 37% of the cost of public schools back to 50%. Really make it a partnership. Right. And, and I think that's one of the first things that we ought to consider. Let, proper, let local property taxes um, uh, supplant but not supplement state funding. If you uh, just do a back of the envelope on that, that's a $12 billion fix. If you just say lower property taxes, raise state spending, just to balance it. Don't add another dollar to public ed, just go like that. It's about 5.7 billion a year. And the question becomes, like it always does, where are you gonna get the money, A, and B, if you're in a Senate that has been, that could be described charitably as price sensitive, right? <laughs> then where do you- I happen to know you're not that sensitive. Where do you, where do you get, the, where, where do you find a bag of magic beans that's got $12 billion there, in it? There are no magic beans. Uh, it is going to have to be done incrementally, right. but if we don't start, we'll never get there. And that's true of the recapture issue as, as well as the proportion. And so, so part of what we need, ought to do is we, we have, the start is we have to be very honest about what the real issues are. So, for example, and, 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 and a lot, I, some of you have heard me say this before, what they do, this is a secret, but I'll share the secret. What they do at the beginning of each session is they take us all into a back room. And have y'all you, you seen the movie Men in Black? <laughs> well, they take us into a back room and they hold up one of those little deals and they go, boom! And they wipe out our memory from all previous sessions. <laughs> and so we start over each time. So for example- That, that explains a lot. Yeah, it does, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. It's the best explanation you've heard, isn't it? <laughs> so, so but, but, but here's what happens is in things like this, in 2006, there was a special, a special session that was in part that was to deal with school finance and in part to deal with property taxes. And so what happened, what came out of that was the Sharp Commission's work that reformed the so-called business or margins tax that because there was a reduction of roughly a dollar fifty per hundred dollar valuation to around a dollar per hundred dollar valuation in property what what local districts could do with property taxes creating a delta they the legislature was told at the time by the comptroller your margins tax fix will not cover it there was a fund created called the property tax relief fund great name uh, that was used to cover up the hole then in 2009, Obama covered up the hole with the Relief Act, and by 2011, we didn't have secret funds, and we did all the cutting. Well, now move up to 2015. Guess what happened? The legislature cut the margins tax, creating an over $2 billion hole. So, we, we, first of all, we've got to start being honest. Right. 
Um, and, I, and I think that there are potential, I mean, we, we ought to be looking at what we do with severance tax and that sits in a $12 billion fund, how that might be used to, to, to pro provide help to public schools, that kind of thing. But, right. but, but the key here is we've got to have an honest discussion about it and quit playing games. Do you think you have a Senate now that will have an honest discussion? I mean, it's always optimistic at the beginning, I know, but... Again, I, I go into this feeling better than I have felt in part because people are saying this is an issue we have to address. The elections, I think, had a consequence. Now, once we get in and they pull out the little deal, <laughs> I don't know what happens. I, I, it depends on the degree to which people believe that folks are really watching and want some solutions. Right. Because the only way we'll get to those solutions is a, is a really good, honest, and sort of mission-focused dialogue. You were both on the ballot this year. Do you get any? Do you get, come back with some voter feedback on that? I mean, do you have a sense of that? Where voters are? Are they paying attention? Are they paying attention to get some things done? Or are they paying attention to, I really like this shiny thing over here? I got 88% voter feedback, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and was the only Republican who voted against the appraisal caps, and one of only two Republicans who voted against the the voucher bill. Um, every election, and it's certainly true of local government, every election is a tax election. And, and, and it's, yeah, I got a lot of voter feedback, but I do town hall meetings in all of 37 counties and things like that. Right. And, and continually talk to people, and it's ongoing voter feedback, and it's very, very important. We always agree. No, but that's very important to stay in touch and find out what people are thinking here, because we know what people are thinking here. Well, presumably, I mean, those those well, counties are all the color of your tie, and the and the I, I like the tie choice here. This is great, <laughs> purple. Yeah. Um, but but you know, to my point, I mean, seventy six percent of the rural counties, of the voters in the rural counties in Texas, voted for Ted Cruz. They mm -hmm. were really solidly Republican, and they were presumably among the people who were being satisfied by the partisan stuff you guys were fighting about two years ago. And so while what's the, their feedback? What's, what that figure doesn't show, though, is, is that educators were, were especially motivated and mobilized in this last election, as were local government officials. And, and I, I think that was one of the keys, not just to my reelection, but some of the outcomes in some of the other areas of the state. And... Um, You've just got to be able to listen to that and look at polls are fine, but they, they will not substitute listening to people. And, and, and I, I agree with all that. And I got a lot of feedback. I, I am elected from a district that pays very close attention and never hesitates to let me know how it's thinking. <laughs> And, uh, and I love it's a, that. It's a company town. Yeah, I, I love, yeah, that's right. And I love that. And, and you cannot go to a town hall meeting or any gathering uh, of, of, of even a few people where they're not aware that what's happened on property taxes is having a direct and specific impact so that in this next year, more of their property tax dollars go to the state of Texas under recapture than stay in the Austin Independent School District. They know that. They also pay attention to what the issues that we're actually fighting about up there, like bathroom bills, and they want to know why it is that we're not taking care of that. So, um, again, I agree with Kel. I think that was part of the message around the state, and I think it's, it's uh, the good sign is, as we go into this, we're at least talking about what the priority issue ought to be. I, uh, and one of the things, clearly, that people are most concerned with are property taxes. And what I tell people in my town hall meetings is, if you don't like your property tax, get rid of the people who are taxing you that way. I was elected six times to city council, five times now to, to the state senate. Every election is a tax election. Every election is a recall election. Don't miss that opportunity. Set your own taxes. You can do it by charter with a simple petition, and you can cap it in any city, waiting around 19 months for us to fight about it and, and then completely sort of lose the issue. It's not the way to control those taxes because it's, it's, 
local property taxes, very much a local issue. And, and the only part that I, I may disagree, if I, if I understood what he just said. You've been wrong before. Um, um, <laughs> But not today. Um, <laughs> uh, but the the the, um, the thing I disagree with that is that while sh I completely agree that that we ought to let local government and local and people voting in local elections deal with those issues at the local level, but when the school finance formula has become so skewed. That and the state is relying, as you already pointed out, uh, on so much. The, the percentage uh, is now so skewed toward local property taxes. The TEA, the Education Agency's Legislative Appropriation Request, looks to an increase of 6.77 percent per year in the upcoming biennium increase in property values for increased revenue from those property taxes to fund the state school system, then it's it's not so much go change your mayor, go change your city council or your county judge or commissioner's courts. It's state legislature, elect, statewide elected officials, you need to address well, that. Yeah, and we don't disagree with that. My point is only as it regards that local property tax. The dynamic is, is you're absolutely right. Do you them think in talking call. about the school finance uh, issue, and I want to move on to, to the House for a second, but uh, do you think in talking about the school finance issue, you know, there's a tendency among some legislators to say, well, you know, that's how the formulas work. Do you, got, you guys set the formulas. Is there going to be a rewrite of these formulas? You it, know, it, is I, it I causing you, a problem? It, it has driven me crazy to hear people say, well, that's the way the formula works, as though somehow it's biblical <laughs> and we, we can't change it. It is, that is our job. If the formula is set up so that when property values go up and more property tax comes in, local property tax comes in, that the state's share goes down, we can fix that. And we ought to fix that, particularly if we're going to stand up and say, I'm going to do something about your property taxes. It's hard, and it goes back to that Gordian knot. It goes back to how you need to be, you need to have the problem solvers trying to solve problems, and it needs to be bipartisan. It needs to be inclusive. Um, but that's what we ought to be doing. Okay. There's, there's no part of the formula or any part of school finance that should not be scrutinized and consider whether it's formulas, multipliers, and things like that. Some people talk about, let's just do away with, with all the multipliers and things like that. And that's fine if you put enough money in the basic allotment that, that directs it to, to those institutions and schools that have where you've got special ed and, and English language learners and, and things like that. The tasks to be accomplished are the same. Right. How the money gets there is, is a perfectly fungible concept. Yes, we should look at the formulas and everything else that has to do with school finance. Okay, let me give you a chance to crab on the house for a minute here. Can you believe they're picking Dennis Bonin to be the speaker? <laughs> sure. Dennis Bonin is a very smart guy and he's committed to the House of Representatives. And, and, and having worked with, with Dennis and, and, you know, he's got a lot of depth of intellect and things like that, I think he's going to be a good speaker. But he is going, his, I think he's going to feel his first mission is the success of the house. And, and there's, there, obviously there's some potential conflict there, but I think it's, uh, it's going to be a, a well-led institution. My experience working with um, with him has been that he is very smart. He's very strategic, um, and and if you look at how he became the speaker designee or whatever is the uh, politically correct term for for what he is right now, and you look at that, if he runs the house the way he ran that campaign, that is going to be a very well run chamber. He's a very canny fellow. Nobody's going to trick him. Yeah. You know, we had this, we've had this interesting sort of dysfunctional family thing going on at the parents' table for the last couple of sessions with the Wednesday morning breakfast with the governor and the lieutenant governor and the speaker and the controller, and it keeps falling apart. Um, and, you know, you remove a personality. You know, Dan Patrick and Joe Strauss haven't gotten along well. That's not a big secret. Um, you put in a new guy. How do you think that, how do you think things are going to go at the Wednesday morning breakfast? 
Well, I, I have no way of knowing. It depends on what they serve, I imagine. Um, but, um, but, but a big part of that is, I, I'm, I'm going to go back to where I keep, I, I know I keep saying this over and over again, but at least people seem to be talking about what priorities we ought to have and we're not hearing as much about priorities that have uh, created problems in the past. And, uh, and I take everybody at their word that what they want to do is have a productive session that doesn't involve just fighting. Okay. Are there four or five issues that you would yeah. point at? Well, let me point out here. Sure. Here's the way the, 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 the Wednesday morning breakfast ought to start. Here's the issues. What can we do together to get this there? If the Wednesday morning breakfast starts with, I want, I want, I want, it's going to be the same old situation. So if you get a property tax bill that, like last time, this one wants six, that one wants four, and this one wants two and a half, that's a mess. It just depends upon the, the intransigence that, that exists there. Is there a way to get there? I think that that 6% might have, have, have passed. You guys Last are time. you guys are sort of in harmony, which is you know not necessarily the usual thing at the end of a session for anybody. But it's, as you go into this session, do you have a sense that there are four or five things that the House and the Senate and the Governor really, really want to do that you think are going to be the marks of this session? Can you tell at this point? You know, the budget's always the first thing. Everybody's talking about school finance. I mean, what's your sense of the of the big markers as you see them from here? Well, we, we've said it over and over again. Um, how we deal, so we had a, we had a school uh, finance commission, a public ed finance commission that is wrapping up its work. Um, in my view, what happened last session was that the House did a pretty good job of at least trying to address public ed. I don't think we, we did a good job on the Senate side. Uh, instead, the Senate kept wanting to put a poison pill into it and was told by the House, if you do that, it is a poison pill and it'll kill it, which was uh, a form of vouchers. And instead, what we got was the commission. The commission's work, that, you know, I don't agree with everything in that, but, but if you watch, if you look at what's happened there, there's some really good starting points to talk about things. Uh, the governor has laid out a proposal that, again, there's parts of that that, you know, I, I must admit my knee jerks to, but there's also some things in there that you can be hopeful about. If we start from there, and we, then that, that clearly becomes, and, and things like, by the way, things like how do we deal with um, early childhood development, universal pre-K, what do we do in order to get third grade achievement, things of that nature. That's a big issue. Um, then we, property taxes will be, play a role, and my hope is that we focus on the real culprit there and get away from, as, 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 as Kel and I have suggested, other issues. So that, that, that would be your second. I do believe that we're going to have to deal with uh, child protective services uh, because the- Deal with in what way? What do you mean? Well, the, the, we've had a federal court declare our system unconstitutional uh, because our system, when, when children are in our care, they are at an unreasonable risk of harm. And those children, uh, that, that case went up to the Fifth Circuit and the Fifth Circuit held that aspects of the, of the district court's ruling were valid. So we have to do something in that regard uh, and address some very specific issues. So I, 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 otherwise, we're going to have trouble there. I, I see that. I think higher education, uh, higher education funding, because of the way we dealt with it last session, will lead us to needing to deal with it, um, importantly, uh, during this session. So that would be three or four that I would have immediately come up with. Clearly, clearly pensions are, are oh, a, yeah. Yeah. A, an issue and things like that. And we get specifically into TRS care. Absolutely. At one point in the session last time, we were in a this situation. This is the health plan for teachers. Yes, right. it's a health plan for teachers. We, we were in a spot where premiums are going to be $4,000 a month, where the average annuity is $2,000 a month. My assertion was that if you can't afford your insurance, the same thing as not having it at all. Clearly an untenable situation. And we're going to have to address that. Uh, in higher education, if we're going to have 60% of Texans uh, have a, some sort of de degree or certification by 2030, we're going to have to really expand the effort. And, and it's a good effort so far. And we're seeing some success. Um, 
we're going to have to see to it that, uh, that the higher education establishment is attuned to that mission. It, quite frankly, a good part of that is going to be in community college. That being the case, we have more young people than ever before who are the first generation of their family to ever go to college. And in a state that's growing a substantial amount, we're going to have to address that in higher education, both in terms of accessibility and affordability, <clears throat> the alignment of, of, of curriculum to make sure that kids don't waste time in college with credits don't, that don't transfer. There are a lot of issues there. And the one, one other thing I would mention, I agree with the, mm -hmm. that as well. Um, one other thing I would mention is we've, we've set, we set last session a path on updating our uh, state hospitals yeah. over a three biennia uh, term period. A lot of this was just bringing them up to building code. Well, yeah, we had five of ten that were basically unsalvageable, but, but it's more than just that. Part of what we did that I think was really smart last time is we allowed for planning money to go as we move through these, these biennia to let um, – health institutions right. like the medical schools help work with the state hospitals to create more of a plan and not just a not just put paint and up, update building but how do we deal with brain health in a 21st century way and so we're going to need to go back in and make sure we stay true to that three biennia plan we probably need right now today and i'm really just guessing at this somewhere between 2,000 3,000 new beds in state hospitals Tomorrow morning would be soon enough, I think. 300 or so of those are in West Texas. And, and that ought to be a real funding priority because we've got to have them now. Your county judge, if he has to make a civil commitment right now today, is going to have a tough time. And, and we need to address that because we have, that's an, something we just have to do. Is it a hard sell in the Senate and in the House? No, not, it, it shouldn't be um, because we've made such progress. Right. Um, uh, we've made we made real progress, and then last session we committed to a three biennial approach because it was th such big bites. Right. Um, some of us supported going ahead and just doing it then, uh, but but that was not a, a viable option. So and then so what we did is we actually we put planning money in so that we would be ready this session to then when we put the the, the additional money in you could you could fulfill the obligation. So. It's, it's a lot of money, and that's where it becomes a hard sell. But, you know, in my view, we're, we're looking at, we're looking at uh, utilizing the rainy day fund for Harvey and school safety. Um, this is a good opportunity to use this because it's one-time expenditures and would bring, bring us up to where we need to The be. first person who quantified it was Republican Senator Schwartner yeah. right. to a very bipartisan representation there. And so I think that we'll get there once again. We need to get going. And, and Chairwoman Nelson has been very mm. helpful. You have a handful of new senators coming in, Paxton, Fallon, Nathan Johnson, Beverly Powell, so on. Um, they come into your office, they knock on the door, and they close the door and say, how does this work? What kind of advice are you giving the new guys? Uh, listen to me. <laughs> It's funny because when they come off office, they say, be careful about listening to Watson. <laughs> 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 what, what I tell them is, first and foremost, represent your district. No matter what you're told by other people here and third-party groups, listen to the people in your district. And then, just listen. And, and throw away, you know, what some of my advice is, and it's to, to both, as you come in, be willing to throw away labels because you may, you may think you know everything about that person because they have some label on them, mm -hmm. whether it's Republican or Democrat or conservative Republican or Tea Party or whatever. You may think that because of that label, you know everything there is to know about them, but my experience has been that when you listen and you don't, you don't just turn your back because of the label, you gain a lot of insight, and you, you gain friends, and you gain people that will vote for your bills. I'm going to open this up to questions in just a second. There's a microphone here in the aisle and a microphone here in the aisle. If you just line up, we'll get to questions. A warning, if you make a speech, I'll cut you off. Keep your questions short, and we'll get to the answers and let, let these guys talk. I want to um, ask you guys about derailers. What, what do you see, if you see them now, are issues that might 
derail things. A, a couple of years ago. I was going to say they're a pretty good band. Pretty good band. <laughs> I, I was going to say the same thing. That was exactly other, what I was other than, other than whether yeah. UT and Texas A&M ought to be playing a Thanksgiving game yeah. every year. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do you see some, some politically shiny objects or some um, perilous bills? We knew going into last session, bathroom bill was one kind of a derailer. But we also knew that the legislature was going to consider some serious... Uh, what was called the Sanctuary Cities Bill, some serious legislation there, and it was it was full of problems. Do you see issues like that that are um, potentially problematic? How's that? Again, they certainly have not been talked about as loudly and as much as going into last session. I don't for a minute believe that we're not going to see things like that but the fact that it's not being so vociferously laid out there gives me hope that they will not be as, as, as functionally derailing things. They may be things that get debated. They may get things discussed. They may even get things that pass that I would really hate to see pass. But at least right now, the different feel is we seem to be talking about, and, and, and most folks seem to be talking about, priorities and how we do this together uh, than we did last session. It, what I would like to see us do is take a look at those absolute necessities and priorities, like the ones we're talking about now. Don't take anything up until we've done those. Right. And so those discussions that are not just important but absolutely necessary don't get derailed because of discussion of bathrooms or vouchers or whatever. Uh, we can take those up. We have plenty of time to do that. But don't let them divert us from the things that we have got to get done. Okay. Um, let's open it up for questions here. Let's start with you. Thank you. Um, you talked a lot about public education. I know that's a real issue that needs addressing, but I think there's a growing public awareness about the effects of climate change. If we don't get cracking on those problems, I mean, in the next decades, we're going to see a lot of issues, economic ones especially, here in Texas. And I'm wondering, are you all seeing any any comments or any concerns from your own constituents or or any getting any hints of it or around from other uh, representatives senators are they getting anything uh, on this topic you, okay are you guys hearing much about this are you hearing much about climate change because and the government report has come out i was here and not in the district we're going to hear that discussion but quite frankly in the 31st uh, district in West Texas, we are generating more electricity with wind than anywhere else, I guess, in the world uh, because we are where the natural gas is. We're seeing more and more natural gas used as, as an energy source. And so we're doing something about it with the realization that we always have to do better with how we do, how we do those things. It is going to be a very robust discussion going forward. I hear about it quite a bit. Um, and I think that what we've seen up until now, legislatively, is a willingness to ignore it. Um, and, but I believe that, as, as the senator points out, with the report that's now out, and with having to deal with things like what we have seen recently with Hurricane Harvey, uh, and even the flooding and issues, the, the, the storms that we've dealt with here in Central Texas, I think people are starting to wake up to this. My hope is that we, we again, don't just divide up based upon dogmatic approaches. Uh, I, I, my hope is that there'll be more talk about it this session than we've seen in past. Is there an obvious step off on that? Is there an obvious place to, I mean, climate change is such a big topic. Is there an obvious, like, this bill first, this bill first, we can do that, we can do that, we can do that? The way I would approach it without saying this specific bill, I, I've had bills that it, it, I think would have addressed some of this, some things, but 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 I think instead of just talking about bills, what we ought to do is we ought to ask questions about what are no regrets types of things. Could we, could we, something like, and I know this sounds small, but it makes a big difference. If you change out lighting in such a way that you reduce energy use, right. um, you, that you, have, you have no regrets over something like that. It's not, it's, you know, if, if, if it's not caused by man, well, all you've done saved money with your lighting use and that things of that nature. I think we need to look at specific outcomes that would make a difference and try to avoid the overall debate of 
uh, because that just gets uh, that becomes a derailer in some ways. The overall debate of who's right or who's wrong mm -hmm. on what's causing it. Although this report will be very helpful. Thank you be. very much. Thank you. Thank you. If I understand the timing correctly, the next legislature will be dealing with reapportionment following the census. Right. Are y'all seeing the shadow of that affecting what you're doing now? You guys never talk about your districts, do you? Yeah. No. <laughs> um, the, 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 I'll just say redistricting will occur after the, after the 2020 census, so in the 2021 <laughs> legislative session. Uh, unless we have a real derailer during this next session. Right. And, um, and so far that's not been a big topic of discussion other than that you had an election that really changed the way some people saw some districts. Um, I chaired the committee on redistricting in the, in the last time that we did it. And, and we have an ongoing statistical product called the American Family Survey. And so we can look at those trends going forward and should. And what they're going to show us is the demographic shifts that we've seen over the last several years in Texas continue apace. Uh, how do they affect us and how we have to address them? When you do redistricting, the first thing that you have to do or look at the impositions of the Voting Rights Act. And uh, that has a lot to do with the way that map looks. And, and, and we'll start looking at that in greater depth going forward. You know, one of the things that's changed in the last 10 or 20 years is that normal humans talk about redistricting now and they didn't you know back i mean 10 or 20 years ago you didn't hear normal conversation in town halls about it except once in a while and around the country there have been a lot of calls for redistricting reform redistricting commissions things like that as a precursor to the redistricting do you see anything this session coming up of, you know people is, is this a potential derailer is this a potential conversation i don't think it's a potential derailer but i do think it is there will be bills filed um, I think the reason the public is becoming more and more aware of it is because they see more and more gerrymandering making a difference. And they see that in some districts, if you're a Republican, you don't have a voice. If you're a Democrat in some districts, you don't have a voice. And they see that it makes a difference when you get to the, when you put them all in the same room after they're elected and they can't reach across the aisle because it might do them damage in a primary. Um, and so uh, I, think, I think the public is, is more aware, and I think we need to address how we do it in a better way. I don't know that you see more and more gerrymandering because it's been a pretty gerrymandered map since 1845. Right. And, uh, but but the, when it comes to bills that are going to be passed, I don't think anything is going to pass when it has to do with the method of, of reapportionment that and redistricting. Question, is there any legislative appetite for change here? I don't think so. I, don't, I think that you'll be filed and it won't be listened to. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. This morning, Representative Zerwas mentioned that school safety is a priority issue for many Texans. Do you see the Senate taking action on a red flag law or closing background check loopholes, two measures that are proven to work, they're life-saving and consistent with the Second Amendment and also cost the state almost no money? And if not, why not? I don't think we're going to see red flag law uh, uh, pass. I think what we're going to see is, as we have the discussion of, of how do we make schools safer, less accessible to those with some mischief, we talk about an awful lot of things, teachers being armed and stuff like that. The thing that we're seeing most frequently is increasing the resource officers. What we did was have police officers that are paid half by the school district, half by the police force. They're active duty police officers in schools. They do a lot of things and protect against, against active shooters. Um, the, the, the thing is, we can talk about a, a lot of those issues. The problem are existing guns that people have access to and have. Um, our, our laws on licensing and things like that are pretty strict and it have been very effective. But I think we're going to have to talk about safety as it exists in the schools and how we can ensure it, not necessarily just a gun or gun acquisition issue. I would support um, red flag laws. In fact, probably will file legislation related to that. Um, I think I don't understand why we, oppose, we would oppose uh, a, a provision that says that if someone is determined uh, by court to be a danger to themselves or to others, we can't say you shouldn't have a, a, a gun under those circumstances. But I agree with Senator Seliger 
that it's not likely to pass. It's a discussion that should be had because people who are, are there's a lot of people who should not have guns, and, and we need to address that. I think my mother-in-law is one of those. You know, we had, we had this, uh, you know, the governor actually had this sort of interesting public conversation about this after Sutherland Springs shooting, and, um, you know, you could do this or this or this or this, and, and kind of did a pretty good job of laying out things that might be done. Do you see any issues where the Venn diagrams overlay, where, you know, everybody's going to agree on that, and nobody's going to agree on that? Are there some areas where you sort of see consensus emerging, or are we too early? I'm not sure that we're too early. What I worry, I, I wish that were the answer. I wish that we were too early in the discussion. I don't think we're going to have the discussion. I think that instead what's going to occur is there are going to be some hard lines drawn, and that's where we are. And, and what I wish we would do is the elected legislature, as, as Kel suggested, there ought to be that discussion. I wish that instead of we're not going to have certain discussions, I wish bills that get filed like that would get hearings, would even have the opportunity to let us have the great debates on the floor and discuss these things, and if they fail, they fail, but that's where you start finding Venn diagrams. What, what happens too often is those sorts of bills, they don't, they don't, they, if they get referred, they don't get hearings, and that's what we miss. Uh, in, in, in my view, in, in reaching those Venn diagrams. How can we not have a discussion? What we're really saying is, how do we prevent somebody from going into school and killing children? That discussion must begin with, what could we have done or should it have been done to prevent what happened in Sutherland Springs and in Santa Fe? That's the discussion we, we most need to have, I think, first. I'm gonna start over here. I think she beat you to the microphone. Yeah, hi, I'm Marcy Purcell with Texas Adoptee Rights. My quick question is, what can, what can a, an issue uh, organization like mine that's very specific and very niche, representing a small 2% of the population, what can we do to get our bill through <laughs> um, and to the end? Uh, what are some strategies we can employ that we can get some visibility and, and some support and, and really reach the finish line this session? I think the first thing is, is that members of your organization and from all over the state need to go see the people who represent them in the Senate and the House and say, this is important and this is what we, we, we think need to be done. That's where that dialogue ought to start. I agree, and, and you all work very hard. You just need to keep it up. I think, I, I think you have done a, a good job of continuing to educate, but with a lot of issues, it takes multiple sessions to, to fully educate. How about you? So taking it back to school safety and your comment on preventing um, school shootings and school violence, how do you see the Senate um, approaching issues um, pertaining to school mental health personnel services and programs? Clearly, th any part of, of education of both teachers and certainly counselors there's gonna to have to be a healthy mental health segment in there. Those are the ones who have the most immediate access. And then how do they access mental health on down the line? So you have a couple of kids who are wearing dark trench coats and, and sticking to themselves in school. What is the message there? And that's gotta be addressed in that form, but the first thing that would happen is school personnel and counselors. And, and for example, here locally, we've had issues where because of the, the the change, the federal government's change in the way we deal with certain disrupt type projects, we found that, that in schools where we had uh, effective mental health uh, care, uh, that we were losing that. So we've gone back and redone some things here locally. I, I just point that out to you to say that there are multiple layers to, to how that plays out. I, I feel good about two things. One is, that because of, of some very specific people in the, in the legislature that have focused on mental health, I don't think we will lose focus on that. As we go to that second point I would make, we start dealing with issues related to the needs of our school and our public education system. I think it will be a priority item um, and so, I, 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 again, I have some hope in that regard. More and more. What's the no to that? What's the, I mean, to mental health? 
changes with regard to gun laws? Isn't that one of the areas where there's not really a, you know, here's this side, what's the other side? Money. Uh, yeah, money. money. Okay. But, and more and more, I think social media is, is going to play a, a role. If you're a school counselor and you see this student and you think, I wonder what's, they seem sort of dark and they're not performing well, I think one of the first things you're going to go to social media and look what their social media musings look like. Are they threatening or, 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 or what? And I think that's going to play a role too. It's going to change the nature of school counseling, I think. Does that move you toward a red flag law? Aren't you right on the edge of it? Potentially. Okay. Potentially, but, but you find in teenagers that they probably don't have guns anyway. And if their parents do, they have them legally. So I don't think that's the answer to that particular situation. Right. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, Senator Seliger, this is more a question for you. Uh, I heard you. <laughs> I that heard means you. I really want him to answer it. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm not, I'm not going to be too hard. Um, I, I heard you say that you're in agreement that uh, people who have criminal backgrounds or some sort of mental health history that make them a danger to others shouldn't have uh, firearms. Uh, it seems that those very interested in Second Amendment rights seem to disagree with that a lot of the time. That's really and not exactly what I said. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't mean to misquote you. Yeah. Um, something along those lines, and you can correct me whenever uh, I'm done. Um, I, 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 well, my question is that it would seem on the surface uh, issue that we could agree on. Those with a criminal background shouldn't be able to have firearms or have been evaluated to be a danger. So why, why do you see... What's the reason that people seem to be against that? that are Keep in mind there? that if you've got a felony, you're going to have a problem buying a gun, certainly have a problem getting a permit for it. But how do we as a state go into your house and seize your gun when you live here and here's your dad who is a perfectly legal and, and lawful gun owner? These issues go very deep into things like the Second Amendment and privacy issues. And that's why it's fine to have the discussion. Be careful about reaching a, a lot of conclusions too soon. Right behind you, we got a question. I think this is probably our last one. We're almost out of time. Thank you. Did I'm you gonna, want to say something? I'm going to actually keep it on the same topic. So you were talking about um, the uh, someone taking the the gun a red flag law, or we're talking about education. We're talking about mental health. What about safe storage? Safe storage is a program that we could promote that doesn't infringe on anyone's rights. It helps educate. It educates the gun owner on proper s gun storage. Um, what about passing some kind of legislation, even if it was um, just informational and not, not a requirement by law? Our Texas Department of DPS, um, Public Safety, has $2.67 million dollars allotted for education, why not use some of that money? It's their, it's public safety. There's no reason not to do that. At the same time, exactly what is it you want to impose there? I have a number of handguns and I have locks on them, but are you gonna go into his house just to see that he has locks on them? No, let's don't legislate things that are not enforceable and not viable. I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not suggesting that we impose anything. I'm suggesting an educational program to inform people and to talk about safe storage. We, we had the click it or ticket. We have turn around, don't drown. We have a lot of different policies and um, not really policies, but we have programs in place that educate, that keep Texans safe. No reason not to do it, but as any advertising program and things like that, it's right. going to have its take its place in the hierarchy of funding. Right, and part of that would come from the DPS's two point six seven million dollars that they have available. Well, ask Why them. Why not? Is not allocated for that. We'll ask them. All right, I support a safe storage program, and I like what uh, Representative Howard has done. She has a bill that uh, State Representative Donna Howard from here in Austin that uh, I think. Is thoughtful and auto and is, is worthy of of our discussion when we convene. Okay, our next deal in about 15 minutes is going to be the House agenda. If you could give a big hand to Kel Seliger and Park Rock. Thank you all. Tell us what the Senate's going to do.